Okay, family, we're here. Please forgive me. Um, just had a slight delay, but nevertheless, we are here. Welcome, everybody. We again, once again, back online. I'm just exciting, excited about what's going to take place today. Welcome each and every one to Obara Radio. As we know, which we should already know, Obara means urban books, authors, and writers of America. Where we're dedicated to the promotion of literacy and the advancement of authors and writers from unrepresented groups. I am your host, Stevenson, once again. It's a blessing to be back. Happy Sunday, everybody, and I hope you had a great day. Don't forget to all of our Obawa fans and listeners, please don't forget to follow us on social media. Our pages, which is on Facebook, you can find us at Ubawa, Ubawa Publishing House, and on Instagram is at Urban Authors. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, Ubawa is on the road. Yes, you heard me right, with their own book convention. You can find more information, and you can go and register to, on www.ubawa, that's U-B-A-W-A dot org, forward slash book dash convention dot H-T-M-L. They will be touring in L.A., D.C., and Chicago. So you guys make sure you go and sign up. So moving right along, today... We have on our show a very special guest, Nika Robinson. Nika, Nika Robinson is the author of Pain Changes You. So I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Nika Robinson to our Ubawa Radio, everybody. Hi. So as we go, Miss Nika, are you there? Yes, I am. How is everybody doing? I know I'm good. I know everybody else is on the line is good. So I always tell them, get your tea, get your coffee, get your soda, get your water, get your alkaline, get whatever it is you drink to make you feel feel nourished as we sit back and get ready to enjoy the book that she's writing, which she actually co-authored this book. This book's title is called Pain Changes You, which is a co-authored book, and it's previously authored Serious Thoughts and Speechless. Nika has... <clears throat> has worked with families for over 19 years. Her background includes homicidal and suicidal children, which that I'm taking a back on that one. So, you know, like I said, I have a million questions, but I'm only going to listen to a few. And high-risk families. Witnessing, witnessing the pain of others and herself inspired her to create a book of empowerment and hope. You don't know pain, she's saying, until your vision has been impaired by tears of hurt and frustration. Innocent has been stripped, and you were robbed from finding out who you are and who you could be. Trust was demolished by betrayal and heartlessness. Pain, pain changed the office, and I always say pain produced our purpose, Nika, in this book. They will take you down the road of death, abuse, heartache, and broken bonds that will leave you in disbelief. Witness how to exit is always a light at the end of the tunnel. Your darkness and venture into the light, how you can gain control of your life, and get empowered to be free again. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, this is Nika Robinson. So just to move right into this, because I'm, I'm, I want to get all this good juice, and I'm sure our listeners are, are well, will be well informed. When did you first decide you wanted to become an author? I first started writing poetry at the, when I was in sixth grade. And so... I was a shy little kid, and I didn't really express myself, so I found freedom of expression through my written work. And so over the years, when I, up to my age of 20, I was writing. I kept multitude of paper and notebooks. And so finally one day my husband had, we were sitting down, and I just pulled him, decided to pull him out. And so he was like, well, why don't you think about writing a book? You should start reading. He just started reading different poems. For me, it was just like a mental release, you know, meditation formation for me, and it just helped me out to, you know, freely express. Okay, so you mentioned and said that you were in sixth grade. You were a shy kid, and it gave you freedom. So just give us a little bit about, because it, it elevated you into who you are, and your husband's pushing you and saying, hey, wifey, let's do this. So what are some of the things that you experienced that had you to write all these things down as now being heard, heard by the world? I was always the type that, you know how you have people that know the answers, but they don't um, express it or give the answer because 
I just sometimes we're always sometimes worried about what other people might think, or we think it might be the wrong answer. But really, there, there is a wrong answer. But sometimes there's really not a wrong answer if you're trying to give, you know, trying to tell people and help them out with certain things. So I also like there's a lot of times that I did know the answer to certain situations or certain solutions, but I didn't ever give it to people like I should have or I really wanted to. Okay. Okay. So by you going through this pain in the early stages caused you to do what you're doing now is dealing with people, children that were homicidal and suicidal. I'm sure our listeners were going to be blown away from the information that you give them. So basically, how did you decide on the idea for your first book? And, of course, you've written many other books. How did you decide on them? A lot of my writing got deep once I lost my mother at the age of 19. Um, you know, I was 19, a new mother of a young boy. I mean, you know, and so that's when really reality really hit me of life. And so Serious Thoughts was my first book. And I just experienced all the times where I didn't express myself, express my thoughts, and a lot of people would come talk to me. I don't know why they felt that um, I was just that come-to person, but I'm glad they did. They would come to me. And so... I wrote Serious Thoughts because a lot of us have our own thoughts that we are afraid to express, or we're thinking some of the same things, and we're afraid of being ridiculed, or we're afraid of other people's perceptions. So I wanted to give a book of, you know, thoughts of myself and other people that I have encountered in that work in society. Okay. So your very first book, what was the name of your very first book? Serious Thoughts. Serious thoughts, and you said people came to you, gave you ideas, and were speaking to you. And you said, "I didn't know why." So it's just like whatever you were dealing with, they were dealing with. It allowed you to really pour back into the book and allow you to keep going on to where you're at now. It pain changes you. Correct. So it's helping others because of the pain. Again, pain produced purpose. You're living your life poured out through your books. Yes. So your book is detailing. About you said suicidal, homicidal, the pains, the thoughts, the perceptions of people. Um, at what point did you decide to take this very serious in what you were doing, considering people were coming to you left, right, front, and back? You you were dealing with issues in the sixth grade, and your husband's pushing you. At what point did you really take it serious? When I first started working with homicidal, suicidal, uh, homicidal, suicidal children, I seen, I really recognized how hurt our youth are and the different things that they're going through and the outlets a lot of them don't have. And so, you know, we're good at criticizing or judging people, but we really don't know what they've been through. And so with me living by the belief and knowing that everybody hurts and goes through pain, you know, instead of asking what's wrong with you, you have to ask what happened to you because there's a lot of times that something has happened to a person in order for them to react or behave the way they behave. And so I found that out just working with these children. You know, how can you have a 11-year-old that's trying to take their life? What has happened to them that they want to take their life at such a young age? And so I just knew I had to start pouring out and help. There's a lot of people out here hurting. I had to pour out and give people hope and empowerment because a lot of them don't see hope and they don't feel empowered because they don't they haven't had the ability to have control of, or have power over themselves. Exactly. And now that, you know, that your books are detailing what you're doing, how it's helping them. So basically, when you've written these books, and the, like when you're reaching back out to these children, how much of a difference have you made with them that have caused them to say, I don't want to kill myself because Mika came and she spoke to me, I don't want to take my life anymore. Well, they, what they need is they need somebody to feel like they care, you know. And so once they feel like they have somebody, at least one or two, a few people that care, even one person, because some people you I run into, they don't have even one person that they feel or that actually cares about them. So, you know, it's hard to build that trust, but you have to be able to understand them and you have to be able to build that relationship with them because we already know trust is difficult. So once you build that relationship and you start building that trust, they're able to see 
that, oh, this person does care for me. They don't have, you know, because we're always looking for something from somebody that's close to us. We feel like, oh, well, it should come from our significant other or it should come from our family, which we would love that too, but sometimes it comes from somebody that you really don't know and get to know. Exactly, exactly. And, and, And now that you have all this expertise in working with them and things, it's like, it's like what was placed to you is being poured out in order for them to really come to that place of happiness because of the pains you experienced, other pains that people have experienced. And now here you are saying, now I can get back to my books. So what was it like, you know, as far as the completion of this first, the very first book that you've done, what was the process like? Some people, I know it's not easy, some people it's easy, but based on all that you had going on, all the things that happened, what was it like for you? And how long did it take you to complete your first book? Well, I had so much work, um, written work, that, and I added some new written work to my first book to where it wasn't so difficult because I had been writing so many years, and I just had a lot of things that fell in place that could um, relate and go into serious thoughts. And so some years after I had lost my mother, you know, I had got off track because, like I said, pain mm-hmm. changed you. So it changed me for, I feel like, the worst because I was looking more at the dark side of things versus the light side. And so once I got into serious thoughts, I, things just started opening up to me. I was like, okay, I didn't think of it like this, or I didn't think about, you know, a certain subject in a certain manner until I started looking at things on the right side. And so, like I said, when we're in so enduring pain, we find ourselves thinking that we're the only one that's going through that type of pain yes. or that certain situation. And so I want people to know that you are not alone. You know, I've been through it, or you might know somebody else is going through it, or you might not know somebody else is going through it. But they can look at that book, and they can read it, and they can relate to it. And another thing that I want to do, I want to do something different with my um, poetry books because the first two are poetry. And so I wanted to give an introduction because I always had an issue with, always hearing the problem, the problem, the problem. Where is the solution? And so I include that in my introduction. I talk about the problem and a process to get out of the issue or the problem that you're going through so you can see a solution to give that hope. Okay. And that's the key thing, the solution. People are always saying the problem, problem, problem. But then you're looking at it like, well, what's the solution? Where can we come up with the answers? And you, based on what you've been through, you already had the answers. Like you said, I was looking at the dark, not the light. And any listeners that are listening, once you put that pen to paper or finger to keys, you started seeing the light behind the dark situations that were saying, wow, okay, now I see it. And now other people can see it. And the beautiful beautiful thing is, is that you've already written it out for them. They have it easier now because you went through that process. I, I just think that is just amazing, to be honest, about how you walked through that. Even my condolences to your mom as well. I mean, my condolences to you for the loss of your mom because I know it wasn't even easier for you once that happened. Yeah. So. So give me the rewarding side of of writing books and being an author. The rewarding side is I love to write and I love to help people. And I love when people come to me and and they be like, you know, this helped me. I never looked at it from this point of view. Or, you know, I can relate to what you're saying. And I just like that the fact that I'm helping other people because I don't like to see anybody go through anything that's unnecessarily that they don't need to go through, and I don't like people to continue to endure pain because, you know, we've got to realize we only got one life. And so during our lifetime, we want to have as much happiness and love and hope as we can. Exactly. And that's what you're bringing to people because, see, out of the darkness comes light because there's always there's always light behind the darkness because it has to shine. And as I was saying before, the reward was, like you said, I love when people come to me, they're happy, they feel good, I thank you for writing this book. You gave people hope, and you've stopped people from killing themselves. I'm sure they probably told you that, right, or their children. Yes. yes. And that's the greatest reward. It's not about the money. It's about getting the story out there, and that's what you did. And I say, I say, big ups to you for real for doing that. Thank you. Because you know, you experienced it, and it's like, why me? And then you find out later on why me, and it's just the best feeling in the world. So, Miss Roberts, was there ever a time that you felt like just totally giving up, saying I'm done, I quit, I give up on this? 
it's been plenty of times. And also <laughs> me also being a shy person, I was also a person that was not um, graced with a lot of patience. And so I would feel at times that I'm not reaching out, I'm not reaching through, or I felt like I wasn't strong enough to give what I was trying to give to the people. But I just, you know, even though I wanted to just stop and let go, God kept pushing me, you know what I mean? And so there's times where we just feel like we can't, we can't, we don't know our strength. And so I didn't want to be that one that started giving that love and that hope and that inspiration, you know, because I want to be able to feed, I want to be able to eat what I'm feeding the people. So I got to be able to have that strength in order for me to feed people that strength and encouragement too. But there were definitely times I was like, I can't do this. You know, I'm, I'm overwhelmed and I don't feel like I'm getting through and it's not working, but you just got to keep going because you are always reaching somebody or, but, or other people. You're reaching somebody. Everybody don't know how to express to you that you are reaching them, but you are touching lives. Yes. You're touching hearts. Okay. So by you being a shy person, person and no patience, you said you have no patience, you are a shy person. Yes. And you said your strength came from God. How did you, when you were overwhelmed with all that's going on, how did you overcome those things in order to complete these books? I'm sorry. I started with meditation. And so okay. I started, you know, playing calm and relaxed music. And also with me working with high-risk families and some children that are going through a lot of things, I incorporated that with my work. And so I would play the common music. We would do like the little yoga, just whatever we needed to relax our breathing techniques. And I'm doing this with three- and four-year-olds or four- and five-year-olds because I want them to learn how to just breathe, relax. You know, I'm teaching them conflict resolutions, all that stuff that needs to be engraved in them at starting at a young age. And so as I was teaching them, I was like, I'm working on it with myself. And so that meditation and that breathing and that relaxation and the fact that I know that what I'm trying to do, I know what I'm trying to do, just let it, you know, do its course. Don't rush it. I think that's beautiful, like you were saying, with all the issues and all the things going on and all the things you've dealt with growing up, being shy, not having patience, being overwhelmed. You found something to soothe your soul, to connect with oneness with your soul and give you peace from within. Then you were teaching the children, this is what you have to do because the external factors are what they are, but when you learn to control it from within, you won't let the external factors take over what you're doing. And that's, that's an even greater thing because you have the power to do that. So I think that's wonderful. And if any of our li listeners are listening, if that's something that you need to do, learn your, like, breathing techniques, meditations, pray, whatever you need to do to calm yourself down because Nico found her outlet and it's working because she's doing great things right now, you guys. So moving on, um, I know there's more to being an author than writing a book. How do you handle the, the, the business side and manage the business side of things? Well, on the business side, because I also like to do workshops, because I feel like I need to bring people in and do workshops with them just to help them, you know, not only – I have the aspect of you reading the side, the literature, but I want you to come in and actually learn how to self-regulate and how to get actually get through your pain. So I have steps that I take people through my workshops. So the first step is identifying your pain. You know, a lot of times we – or who we are, but we don't know why we're like that because a lot of our pain over the years has buried us. We're buried under our pain. So that's why I say identify your pain in order to be able to find who you are as a person because I even lost myself as a person. I let that pain bury me, and I no longer knew who I was as a person. And so a lot of people are lost up under the pain that has been built upon them over the years. So when that first process of that workshop is identifying your pain, and then once you identify the pain, you are able to work on your sense of self, which I call self-analysis. Okay. Do you have a degree in psychology? Did I, I didn't even ask you. I apologize. No. No. You can, 
Do you need to consider it? Because <laughs> you have it. Down to a science. Oh my gosh, I think that's really good. So you're saying your work, aside from people purchasing your books, you offer workshops to them, this is being the business side of it, to help them to identify what they're going through because they've read the books. Now you're teaching them how to identify and deal with what they're dealing with in order for them to move on with life and really be the, the great person that they were created to be, right? Correct, yes. Okay. So are there any other things you do as far as the business aspect of writing your book or uh, getting your book, you know, really out there? I just, you know, not not really. You know, if I might have something like if I have, like, mentoring sessions, I just get it out there, or I go speak at different organizations. I speak at a lot of different organizations that help people get through their issues or their problems because I just love to um, go and speak. And so, mm -hmm. um, and I also try to get people in, pull people in, too, where they want to do the same thing. You know, okay. to get out of the community and help people because, like I said, we need as many people as we can to help each other. Okay. Okay. And I think that's wonderful because your book is now turning into workshops and now turning into speaking. It just keeps growing and adding because the seed was already planted. And now look what you're doing now. And any listeners just listening, the encouragement behind this is it's worth going through the process. It's worth uh, coming to the end of the process, not knowing once the process is over, it's finished. Now you, you, you're utilizing that book, and it's taking you to so many different places. Again, big big ups to you. I don't know if people still use that word anymore, but I'm actually honored to be talking to you about this because it also helps me too. I get helped every time I talk to one of you guys, one of the things I really do. So trying to stay because I told you I have a million questions because you're intriguing me, for, I mean, on so many levels. So do you have an editor, or do you edit your own books? I edit it, Serious Thoughts and Speechless, and my um, Pain Changes You, my aunt edited it for me. She did. Yeah. Okay. So what was the process like with that? Was it easy for you, or, you know, because we – as, you're not a new author. You're not a novice. You're definitely an expert. Was it easier for you as you started writing more and more of your books? Yes, it became easy. You know, I was like, okay, I, I have this. But I have to be truthful. With my poetry books, it was easy. So my last book, Pain Changes You, it, you know, it's more of a chapter book. That became more difficult for me because I was trying to edit it in the beginning on a writer's, you know, aspect versus a reader aspect. And so it's easier with poems because, you know, you're speaking. This is your words. This is what you're speaking, and it, you know what you want to say. But it's different when you have the chapter books. So I fell into a hole of I was trying to edit based off, you know, my vision of the poetry books versus the chapter books. And so once my aunt came in and she helped me through that process, I understood more where I was failing at in that editing process. So it's going to be – you know, it's going to be take another book, another chapter book for me to really kind of, you know, grow into the concept of editing chapter books versus the poetry books. Okay. Okay. Well, it's a learning process, but it's worth yeah. it. Now, I looked at your cover. Here's this beautiful dark sister on the cover with one tear rolling down her face. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a, when I look at the cover, it's mm -hmm. simple, but it's powerful at the same time because we know tears can be joy or sadness. But you can see the expression in her eyes and her face that it's like sadness, but it's also showing that it's quiet, but it's also on the side she's raging. That's what I felt when I looked at it. I mean, I could also write some of your stuff. <laughs> write it out. Write a commercial for you. Because when I looked at it, I was like, that's a powerful statement, that one little tear. And we've seen people in chaos and devastation and wars. They're covered in dust, dirt, whatever. And you see the tears, but you don't know really what's going on in the inside. So who actually came up with that idea? Who created that amazing cover? I came up with the idea because hmm. I feel like the cover needs to really – I want people to feel. I like – I am have an issue with I like the title and the cover just to go right together, and I wanted to pull you right in. And so I wanted that cover to be powerful because when we go through pain, that is powerful. It takes over a lot of us. So I wanted people to feel that power, be able to relate, you know, relate to that cover. 
and be like, yes, it does change you. And, you know, just to be able to look at her face. And I liked it, too, because, like you said, the expression, you could look at it in different aspects. You know, is it a, it's, it's kind of like a calmness to her, but also you see that tear. And you don't really yeah. know if it's a, you know, what the tear is. If it's a tear from pain changing you in a good way or pain changing you in a bad way. Exactly, because that's what I looked at when I started. Even if even if you took the words "pain changes you away," you can mm-hmm. still feel there's something behind this picture, and that's what it gave me. So if anyone looks at it for even two minutes, you'll know. Okay, it's something I need to, I need to read. I need to get out. So we know as writers, sometimes this happens, sometimes it doesn't. But have you ever encountered writers? Block? And if you did, how did you get past that? For some reason, I feel like my mind is always going. I always have either a pen or a paper next to me, or I ha- when I ha- when I'll have that, I have my phone, and I'll use my memo. My memo is full of notes. I'm like, okay, let me put this down so I don't forget it. So I'm constantly thinking. And so my business coach asked me one day, he was like, where did you get this stuff from? I was like, I don't know. I'm just constantly thinking. And as I'm thinking, and I'm a big observer too. So when I'm around people, I observe a lot, and I research and I read a lot. So that keeps me continuously thinking. And so I think I haven't ever encountered writer's block. Hopefully I don't. But I'm just constantly taking notes. It, it's because it's already in you. See, that's a good that's a good thing to take on. Like you said, I'm constantly writing. I'm constantly putting it down. I'm jotting it down. My phone, my tablet, what have you. Because Lord knows we don't have time to pick up pen and paper. It takes too long hands cramping and all that. So we can just talk it and text it or whatever, which is better. But that's a good thing because you're an artist. You're a poet. You're a writer. You you are you are a scribe. So there, you're always readily to put it down and. I take note to that, too, because sometimes I'm like, okay, I do I want to do it, but then I don't. So I need to make it a habit. It becomes a habitual thing for you. So that's good, and some people can't do that. So that's really good. So, well, you've already answered my next question, but I'm still going to ask it anyways. How often do you write, even when you put everything down the way you do? I write weekly, you know, and it's different time. You know, I just write week, weekly, even if it's writing for a book, even if it's writing for a speech, whatever it is. Or, you know, every day I do, like, quotes. I have quotes that I put on my Facebook page. And so I have, like, Motivational Monday, Teaching Tuesday. So I'm constantly worry-free Wednesday. So I'm constantly writing something down, and I'm constantly sharing my thoughts and my writing, no matter if it's social media in my literature, or just standing up verbally. So it's basically daily. Okay, so is it is it like a mindset? You, come on, Ms. Robinson, help me out here. Me, and the listener, because they're listening. How do you, is there a certain mindset that you get in? Because there's so many things going on with life and living and children and babies and spotlights and bosses and all that stuff. What, is there a mindset that you get in order to just keep doing it every day? Well, what it is is, so I'm up early in the morning anyway. So I feel like, you know, we wake, a lot of people wake up and they, we don't know what we're waking up, what mood we're waking up in. We don't know what's yeah. going on in other homes. So I want to be an inspiration and a motivation to whoever might be able to see it. So I get up in the morning and I pray and I think of what can touch somebody today or multiple yeah. people today. And so... I do it early in the morning. It might be 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm putting out the inspiration motivation. And so one of my coworkers, which is also one of my co-authors, she was like, where do you be getting this stuff from? She's like, I feel like we didn't talk, but we ain't really talked. You know, she was like, I feel like a lot of it before me. And I was like, you know, I just, something just touched my heart, and I feel like I just put it out there. And what gets me, I don't pre-plan a lot of it. It just comes to me that morning. Most of them. Okay. Already downloaded. Yes. It's down. It's like a computer. Excuse us while we, while we reboot and update the computer. You're being updated every night. I love that. You, you saw out. You asked, and it and it, it was put in you. It came to you. So this is what I need you to put out today. This is what I need okay. you to write today. So, tell us about if you had one. Tell us about your last book signing and how was the experience for you. 
my last book signing was uh, it was good because it was me, my co-authors, and so it was an emotional book signing. And so people, you touch people in ways. You know, sometimes you go to something and you think, oh, they're just going to talk a little bit about a book, something simple. We're just going to. I like to do. I had a workshop slash book signing. So I had an uplift and empowerment workshop among the book signing in order to give people what they need. You know, I'm going to give you some verbal and some verbal love, and then also I'm going to give you some love out of that literature that you are, you're getting and taking home with you today. Okay. I, I think that's great. I do have a question about that, though. You see at a workshop slash book signing. Did you have professionals in the realm of of, of, of of dealing with children, you know, victim advocate, abuse, and whatnot? Have you had those type of people to come to you and ask you for advice and have read your books, aside from just, you know, pe- pe- the everyday people? Have you had people like that come to you? I've had a few people come to me, and so I have people that have dealt with a, and are still dealing with a lot of things, even from childhood, but they're adults. And they come to me and ask me, you know, how do I, how should they handle a situation and how should they get through it? And I think a lot of people are comfortable with me because I am not the person that's quick to judge. For example, there's people that say they have been molested by a family member, but they're still dealing with the family member. And, you know, most people are like, how can you and, you know, and all that. You don't know what people are thinking or what they are going through. And so, and how their heart is. And so one of the parts of pain changing you is battle of forgiveness. How many of us battle with forgiveness? How many of us battle with broken yes. bonds and families and relationships? That's another yes. portion. So, you know, I feel like people are more comfortable because not only, even in my book, Speechless, I wrote, wrote from the realms of the, pe- of the minds of the people, the minds of the abused. You know, how many people can you step into their mind frame just by talking to them? I talk to the abused. I talk to the people who are, get a thrill out of causing pain and heartache. So I have stepped into the minds of the people, and I have, you know, spit out what they feel and how they feel in order for you to understand them. So that's why I call it speechless, because you are getting into the minds of the people that you have not ever understood. And probably some people will never will. So I kind of got off sidetrack of the question, but my thing is, I, a lot of people come to me, even the, hurt maybe, ones, maybe. even the ones that's hurting, you know, they come yeah. to me because they know I'm going to come back to them with some understanding and love and non judgmental. Exactly. And, and, I just want to piggyback on that because I think it's great. I hear the passion in you. I've experienced some hurt in you too, but I, I hear the passion in you. And the beautiful thing is, like I asked earlier, did you have a degree in psychology or whatnot? You said no. The beautiful thing is about your books and what you have written, people can come to you because you're relatable. You, you have a passion for the minds of people. And your book sign is literally turned into counseling sessions. <laughs> Well, I just think that's great because that's another area that you will tap into or are tapping into because it's more than just, oh, here it is, sign my book, it's $25, take a picture, and have a nice day. No, you're making it interactive for the people. And then they're turning around and wanting to hear from you because I need to meet the author of this book. No, I don't, need, I don't need another pill. I don't need a counseling session. This is my medication. This is my Prozac. This is my Zoloft. This is my whatever they're giving out today. And I'm not knocking the psychology industry. I'm not knocking anybody that's out there in counseling because you are needed. It is, you are very valuable to people. But I just think it's great. That's just something else that from that book signing has now turned into workshop, has now turned into counseling. Great job. <laughs> just, just, just a great job. I, just, just, I, I don't even know what to say even after that. But um, we, we all know, because we to move forward, we all know, thank God, for social media. Because social media has made more people more famous and well-known than any other outlet. And I know you use it, correct? Yes. Okay. So what, how, what other ways do you use um, 
besides social media to get your books out there? I know you mentioned workshops, but other what other ways do you do? Well, basically just social media um, outlets. I just use, like, Facebook. I use, I'm on LinkedIn. And I'm not really, I know we're in a technical um, society, but I use it a little bit, but I don't use it as much. I'm still a little bit old school as far as, you know, a lot of people like the books on their computer, which is fine, you know, because it's convenient. But I'm more of a give me a book, give me a blanket, lay down and relax, and I'm going to read. You know, that's more my type. Or even with the speaking, I'm going to speak to you face-to-face, you know. I can easily text you. I feel like a lot of this stuff, is, you know, with the text and the email, we kind of lost emotions, you know, yeah. good communication, one-on-one contact. So I try to mix it up with what I do. So even though I do stuff online, I like to go out and, you know, speak. And so most of my stuff is kind of face-to-face, but I have a little bit of it social media. Okay. So like you said, old school, I want to see you, I want to talk to you, I want to smell your breath, I want to shake your hand, I want to look at you. And like you said, the lost art of communication is through emails, texting, and social media. But that's a great thing because you still believe in a system that has never been broken. Yeah. We just decided to get lazy, not with us, I'm not speaking that, because um, – some people have decided to get lazy and just sit back and wait for the people to connect with them. But you said, you know, I'm going to go out there and connect with the people, which I think is great, and it's a good thing. Because you're a talker. Talkers want to talk to people, look in their face, not just, oh, I talk to you on the phone and be all inspired and I get in front of you and I have nothing to say. Because <laughs> we've talked about everything. So, so, yeah. So as a woman of color, what inspires Ms. Robbins the most? What inspires me the most? What inspires me is I see working with, um, working around a lot of women or being, you know, helping a lot of women of color. And some of their beliefs, or some, you know, it's like a lot of, like I said, a lot of their hope has been gone. It's just missing. It's lacking. And so I believe it's, it's already hard between women anyway because I feel like it's a lot of competition it's a lot of jealousy. So I feel like once we men that broken bond and when we work together, then that's I just want to uplift each other. So that's what I do. You know, I work with a lot of women. And so, you know, I'm like, look, we need to work together in order for us to get anywhere and to be able to do anything. Okay. So – what is your main inspiration come from? Because like you said, there's a lot of jealousy and a lot of sadness and a lot of hate. A lot of women are not loving themselves. They're adding hair, lashes, makeup, body parts being taken away and added. But your inspiration is coming from you're, – you're your own inspiration. When I listen to you, you're your own inspiration. Because you took everything that was around you that was going negative, bad, wrong, dark, crazy – and you are your own inspiration because you know from whence you came to where you are and what's going on in front of you. Though you can't see everything, I, me personally, you're your own inspiration. Yeah. To watch and hear what you're doing right now is just beyond comprehension. And I'm sure you probably never would have thought, I never would have thought this would have happened to me. No, I didn't. Not at all. But the beauty of it is, is not knowing until it happens because we were all created to do some great things. And like I say, live your life, pour it out, and that's what you're doing right now. So I'm going to say you're my biggest inspiration listening to you on this call. You are to me because it's amazing. Coming, dealing with people with pain and issues and being able to take all that on, try not to carry those burdens and say, I still have to do this. I still have to be great. And someone out there listening, there are people that you probably know that don't even know that you're their inspiration as well. So, again, I'm just very honored to be on the phone with you, um, talking to you about this. It's really great. Yeah. Really. So out of all the people in the world, living or dead, breathing or not, who is your biggest influence? My mother was my biggest influence because my mother taught me a lot of things I know. Um, my mom's artistic, and I'm very artistic as well. She wrote a book that she was trying to get published. And, you know, we didn't, back in that time period, they didn't really – 
it driven a lot of self-publishing, so you had to go through a publishing company. But just her writing that book, her showing me the ins and outs of different things and just being yourself and having your own creativity, because a lot of I notice a lot of times people are trying to live their life based off society, what everybody else is doing. And that's another thing that inspires me to empower people to be themselves. Because if you don't know who you are and you're living off somebody else, how can you really enjoy life? And so I see a lot of that. And so I ask many parents or many people, are you raising leaders or followers? Because, you know, we always tell our children, we want them to be leaders. But what are we teaching them? You know, are you teaching them how to research, how to have their own mind, think for themselves? Are you teaching them that they could be a boss instead of leaving out of the educational system and look for a boss? What are we really teaching them? Are we teaching them to be leaders while we want them to be leaders? Or are we teaching them to be followers? Your mother was teaching you like this? <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. My gosh. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. When did she pass away? She passed away in 2000. Okay. Mine was 2004. I mean, that's just the great influence that she passed the torch on to you. And you said that. Mm-hmm. She wrote a book as well. Did you or did she ever get a chance to to publish that book? Because I know you said um, pu- self-publishing was it out. Did you ever publish it? Are you going to publish the book? I never published it, and I haven't really decided. I decided more to open up um, an empowering school for, you know, children through her name. So I haven't really okay. thought the concept of the book, which it would be nice because it's a children's book, but – um, you know, I never know what it was. But the beautiful thing is she passed the torch on you. Now you're going to – because she, she she impacted your life. Now I'm going to name a center after her. And also because of the, the things that were in her flow into you, you're now carrying it on the name and going to do what she was doing. But now it's, it's on you, it's on you, daughter. It's on you. See, like you said, are you raising problems or are you raising leaders? She raised you as a leader. Now you can teach other people that say, will say, I don't know how. I don't have those type of people around me. Their father and their mother is not in their life. You can say, I understand that, and I'm not calling this an excuse. Mm-hmm. But that's the reason why you can come to my empowerment center so I can help you raise that boy or that girl, that young man or young woman into being a great leader because that's what they are. Not getting caught up in the situation or the surroundings because you did not let it overtake you. And I think that's a great thing when you gain that inner strength no one can take that away from you once you realize how strong you are. And that's what you realize through your mom, through what you're doing. You're stronger than your out and surroundings. And I just, I'm just blown away. So, Nika, have you ever done something in the past that you regret? And if you did, how did you get through it? Wow, yes, I have um, done things in the past I regret it. And so, you know, once, we do things in life that we regret. What we do is we continuously beat ourselves up. We're overly critical. And um, we harbor that pain because that turns into another pain. So we have the pain of what we did, and then we start having the pain of not being able to forgive ourselves. And so I had to go through that whole process of dealing with the pain and dealing with the pain of unforgiveness and dealing with the pain of anger and hurt. And so as I keep listening to different things, that's how many bricks that was piled upon me and to where I lost who Nika was. I no longer knew who Nika was. So while I was going through all that pain, I was looking at everybody else like they were the problem because I lost who I was and I didn't, couldn't even focus and see and vision that I was a problem. So once I started seeing and realizing through prayer that I was a problem, then I was able to start focusing on changing myself and also start forgiving myself and, you know, in order to make better choices, in order to change what I You can't take back what you did, but you can always right. change and become a better person. And that's what we need to realize. You can't control yeah. what has already been done, but you can control what you do from then on out. Okay. So this was a build-up from your past. I know you didn't go into it, and you don't have to, 
that cause you to feel angry, upset, unforgiving, bitterness, because it starts building from that one seed. And it just keeps festering and growing because things start taking place around you, and it builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. Have you dealt with that seed that was planted? Oh, yes, I dealt with it. And uh, the seed started from when I lost my mother. I became angry. You know, when you lose somebody close to you, and at a young age, you know, I was still thinking that life was, you know, life is forever. You know it's not forever, but that's how you live day by day. And yes. so as I wrote in that book, um, in that my chapter of Pain Changes You, my mother was very ill. So I went through different processes, processes with the doctors, you know, processes of calling the ambulance when she couldn't breathe one night. And they come mm-hmm. in not one but twice with empty oxygen tanks until she passed out right before me. So I had a lot of anger in a lot of different aspects, anger of losing my mother, anger in I was taught in the educational system, which, don't get me wrong, we need our ambulance people and the doctors to protect us, but there are some that give that field a bad name. So I just happened to run into some of the ones that gave their job a bad name and which caused me to become angered and some of the process I had to go through on mother. So there's a lot of things that I had to get past and get through. Because, you know, the first question you ask is, why me? So when she first passed, I was in that denial stage. Then it became anger. And so the anger continued to build up with anything and everything that was going on around me. Okay. So because I, I can tell you loved your mother very much, much. Was your father in your life? Yes, um... I wasn't close with my father, but he has always, you know, been in my life. You know, they got a divorce that, um, when I was younger, but and he's still in my, you know, my life. So I just had a closer bond since, you know, being in a divorced family with my mother. Okay. Okay. Um, I still, you know, my father does good things in society, and you know, he helps a lot of people t- as well. You know. Okay. So, Oh, yeah. But the, but the anger was towards because this is the one I'm close to, I'm attached to, I love, and you guys are doing nothing with all this expertise and all these giftings and all these certifications. You're not helping her. So I understand yeah. the build up because I experienced it too in 2004. So I understand it. But but now since all that happened, how did you get past that though? Because this is what 17 years later. Yes. Yeah. Well, so how, how did you how did you get past it? got tired of being tired, and then I okay. started looking at life, So, and I started looking at life, too, on the bright side. Like I said, I, I had to step out of the darkness into the light, and I had to ask myself, and we had to ask ourselves every day when we let small things or we let a lot of things consume us. When I lay on my deathbed, if I'm laying on my deathbed, do I want to have thoughts of all the times that I've been in pain, all the negative, all the dark side, or do I want to leave out in peace? And think about the happiness and the love and every and the, you know everything that I experienced in life. I want to yeah. go out, you know, thinking of the bright side of life. Okay. So that transitioned that, my thought process to you know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the beautiful thing is, if you look at some of the great people that have done great things on this earth. I mean, we, we we hate it. We don't want to go through a process or pain or anger, but it builds something great in us, and it causes you to be led down the right path because some people may think, oh, why is this happening? But it's detouring you and leading you into the the plan that was created for us when we were, when we were, when we were born. Yeah. And we have to go through but it also produces in the end, like you said, when I lay on my deathbed, I'm going to think about all the things that have didn't that didn't work, that went wrong, that unhappy. No, because you the good outweighs the bad, the blessings outweigh the the non blessings. So you're looking at, and I like the way the insight, the way you're thinking is. No, I need to look at all the good things that happen, the blessings that happen. I'll see her again, but at the end of the day, I must complete the journey that my life was already pre written out for me. So you got past it. I'm tired of sick of being sick and tired. That's a black people term, a black person. I'm from the South, y'all. I might say peoples <laughs> instead of people. But at the end of the day, when you get to that place, you say, I desire change. I need to find out what this is going to produce in my life. And that's what you found. So I, I'm, I'm many blessings to you again that you overcame it. Yes. Yeah. 
No matter how long it took, you finally got to that place of saying, I'm dying, I'm going to get through this, and you did. So you you talked again. You just keep jumping in my questions. I'm trying to figure out this. Did this lady get my questions? Like, what's going on? <laughs> so how do you get through tough times in your life when life throws what it throws at you? Tough times. So what I do, I, it goes back to the music. I have. I love my headphones. I will throw my headphones on, and I will <laughs> start walking. And depending on how my day is going, how stressed I am, I might even start doing some weights, whatever it is, to get that energy out, that negative energy out. Hurry up and get out of my system. That's what I do. And so um, music is, and I used to wonder why. I was like, my mama loved music. She always listened to music. She would sit, and she was way more calmer than me. I was like, how is she, you know, certain things are going on. I was like, how, in my mind, how is she so calm? How is it not really getting to her? And so, I started realizing the more I listen to music, I was like, okay, you know, it relaxes yeah. my mind, my soul, you know, it keeps you, because your mind is very powerful. One thing you people don't is. realize, mind is powerful. You, you can get your mind to think you into stress, depression, and all that stuff just by your thoughts. So if you keep your thoughts on the, you know, most positive aspect that you can, it's easier said than done, but you start off with that meditation that meditation to get your mind calm, to get you to start, you know, getting on that road. Just like we like let negativity embrace our brain, let's start letting that positivity embrace it as well. Exactly, because whatever you think you become, thoughts become things. This is the, this is the, this is the um, ignition to this car we call a body. Mm-hmm. And like you said, music, I'm sure you've heard this before, where it says music soothes the savage bees. Mm-hmm. They play it for animals when they're enraged. They put it on, and the next thing you know, they are out like a light. That calms our minds. Our minds, your mind, register what you're putting in your ears and in your heart. That's when you get to that place of not allowing it. And like you said, I work out, I meditate, I pray, I do things to get that negativity away from me because I know when it's coming, something good must be getting ready to happen. Something major good wouldn't be coming at me like this. That's how I think sometimes. I don't know if you do. Uh-huh. Yeah. But, you know, you feel me? Yes, artist, artist, that something's going to happen big. So you have to learn how to keep that out of your, your atmosphere, keep it out of your soul, out of your psyche, because if you don't, you'll get caught up in it, and the next thing you know, nothing's getting done, nothing at all. So, oh, boy, we're almost to the end of this year. We only have, like, a... A couple of months, a couple of weeks left. Next thing you know, because they're running Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas all together in the store. So, you know, is it already December 25th? So since we're almost at the end, what is your one goal that you want to accomplish for yourself in 2017? And I might as well go ahead and add 2018 because it's almost here. Well, my one goal that I want to accomplish is I want to get together a workshop, and I'm calling it Boss. Because I feel the reason why I want to call it boss is because I feel like everybody needs to be a boss over themselves. And what it stands for is being over someone special. We have to know that we are special. We have to be able to love who we are before we can, you know, love anybody else. And so, you know, a lot of people think about working for a boss or somebody else is a boss or being bossy. But I want you to take that word boss and implant it on yourself and know that you are trying to be over someone special and that you are someone special. And so once we start finding in ourselves that love and compassion and that we're special and recognizing it, then we can implant it in others. You know, it's only so much a few of us can do or, you know, all of the, we have millions of people over the world. So what we need to do is we need to start planting that seed in other people because a lot of people don't know their uh, strength. They don't know their talents. Because I know a lot of people say to me, well, I'm not good at anything. I don't think so. God put everybody here for That's reason. Right. Yes. You just got to find that reason. And yes. so knowing that you are someone special and that you have control over yourself, because a lot of people feel like they have no control, and some don't have any control. But once we tell people and get, let people know that you got that power and control over yourself and you got that power to control to help build somebody else, then we will start having more people that are leading versus following. And so that's what I want to get done before 2017 go out. I want to get that workshop going that here are some people, stand up, 
because you were someone special. Yes. You made me stand up. I'm sitting here facing the floor listening to you right now because I love it because you say being over someone special. And even as you're talking, I'm just envisioning our entire conversation when I go back from the beginning to where we are now that you're basically telling people, look what I've been through. Look what I've experienced. I've talked to you about what I went through from sixth grade on up. Everything you've been through, every person you've experienced, encountered, talked to, counseled, prayed for, uh, uplifted, encouraged, your book signs and everything, it all started because whatever you went through growing up, you're now going to give back to the people. You gained your strength, you gained your power, your tenacity, your endurance, your perseverance, because you were, you were reaching out and praying to, to God and, and, and telling people, you know, this, this is that. what was downloaded in you was coming out of you because of what you went through. Basically what I'm trying to say to the listeners is, Whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, whatever you're enduring, know that there's a purpose behind it because Ms. Robbins found her purpose and she's living in it. She's writing the books. She's doing the speeches. She's doing the workshops. And the beauty of it is is everything that you might think is painful is already turned into a purpose. Am I right or wrong? You are right. And I'm not getting paid right. for that one. <laughs> but that's how I feel right now. And it, it helps me. And I hope the listeners are listening that it will help them and say, you know what, I'm going to go forth. I'm not going to let this beat me up. I'm going to go ahead and grab this thing by the horns, and I'm going to ride this out till I take my last breath. We have to. We have to. We have to be strong. And, you know, like I said, the more, just like people follow, people like to follow or they like to um, see what everybody else is doing, let's be a, a, a leader of followers. You know, let's lead people, not lead up, I'm sorry, let's be a leader of people that can control. So that's what we need to express and show people, that I am in control, you are in control, and like I said, you are someone special. So definitely if we show that and we implement that and we plant that, then we just hope that people will follow that. If you want to follow anything, follow that. Follow the strength and empowerment that needs to be implanted in the people. You, you know who you sound like to me, and may she rest in peace, um, Maya Angelou. Oh, really? <laughs> because that's all she ever did was encourage you through her words and her poetry. And you're out here building leaders, these youth, because they don't, it's so much going on with the, the younger generation with social media and how everything's just so free and easy and the disrespect. That you're saying, I need to raise leaders up. So when your work is done and you see all that you've accomplished, like you said, when I take my last breath, you can expect these people to be outside with signs, flowers, candles, bears, and all that. Because you've done a, when you do a great work, people applaud that. People acknowledge that. And I just feel that that's what's going to happen for you, that people will be clamoring for you not to die but yet live because you made an impact in their life. You're making an impact, and you're going to make a greater impact on that. I really believe that in my heart. I can't wait to see what happens. So what does Mika have planned next that's, you know, in the works or soon to come out? I know We know the workshop. You're gonna, that's going to happen. I believe you're going to get that thing done before the end of this month that it will be out. But what else do you have planned next? Well, as I was talking earlier a little bit, I want to get – a school started, and I started. I'm getting a business started. I want to um, launch my business called Empower Minds Incorporated, and I also want to get my early learning educational school started. And also, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do it for because people don't know how important it is from birth to five years for to help children grow. So I want to have that age group, but I also want to have the teenagers. We need to get the teenagers in here too. Because a lot of yeah. them have been going through stuff at a young age. And just because they're 14, 15, 16, going on 17, about to go out into society at 18 does not mean they don't need help. And I'm also an advocate of people who adults, because some of them never got any help. So also, I'm, in, I'm more into homeschooling now. Because I'm sorry, I, this educational system, they're not teaching the way I believe a lot of these kids need to be taught. And a lot of it, you know, you can teach them academics, but can you teach a lot of them don't even know self love, self love, mm. control, mm. and you know exactly. empowerment. So that's what I want to teach them. They need to have that first self regulation, you know, conflict resolution. Why do you think so much is going on in our society? Because they haven't been taught these different factors 
they haven't been taught to socialize and how to communicate. And so I want a school open up to be able to do and show those different things. Then we can slide in into the academics and include the academics at the same time. But the academics is not going to be enough going into society. Mm -hmm. Academics is not enough when they're dealing mm -hmm. with the pain that they're dealing with in their environment. And they keep doing that system over and over and over and over again. And when we graduate and they, or they graduate, they'll have to learn life in a way that I don't want to experience. But you're going to teach them about educating you and also life experiences, the reality of life and true love. And I hope and pray you implement what you're doing, and I hope and pray that the parents or whomever are raising these kids that you, you will put a, together a program. I can't tell you what to do that's going to teach these parents how to love themselves and love these children because yeah. they're going to need it. I truly enjoyed this conversation. Um, I really do. Shout out to your husband, all on support, to your co-authors. Shout out to those that have supported you from beginning to now and to the end. It, I really do say special love, much love to them. But I want you to tell the audience, because we have come to an end to an hour of power right here on Ubaru Radio. But, Ms. Robbins, I want you to tell the reader, the listeners, how they can contact you. you know, give them all the information except for your Social Security your cell phone. <laughs> Just give them everything. Okay. Um, you can contact me at Nika, K-N-E-I-K-A dot Wix, W-I-X dot com slash Empowering Minds, Inc., I-N-C. Again, Nika.Wix.com slash Empowering Minds, I-N-C. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't get that, you guys can check out our, our, our social media pages. You can also go to the playback and listen to this again. Ms. Nika, it was a blessing. You empowered me, for real, because Thanks. that's what you do. I'm a grown man. I'm old. But you empowered me, too, in all seriousness. And I thank you again for taking out your time in your evening, on your evening of this fun day, Sunday. Happy Blessed Sunday. I want to thank everybody. Thank Obara Radio. Again, I'm your host, Stevenson of Obara Radio, as we always see, say, and I say, Live your life poured out. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. Have a good evening and take care of yourselves. Good night, everybody.